Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us in the, um, another installment of really wonderful discussions hosted by Chad Brown um, on systemic racism in public lands. My name is Jamie Dawson. I work for a nonprofit called Oregon Wild. Um, we work to protect Oregon's wildlands, wildlife, and waters as an enduring legacy for future generations. Um, and that includes you know, future generations of all people, which is why I feel really honored to get to listen to some of these discussions and, and be a part of them. Um, we are going to be here for about an hour and a half. We've got some amazing panelists that Chad has uh, organized. I'm so excited for you all to meet them and, and hear from them. Um, we are going to be doing a question and answer session at the end. And at any point, you can type in your questions or comments. Um, there's going to be a little kind of a question mark inside of a bubble on the right hand side of your screen. And that's where you're going to enter your questions or comments for the panelists. And we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, but please don't wait until the end. It's hard for us to get through them all at the end. So when something pops up, feel free to just put it in there and we'll try and get to it. Um, this webcast is going to be recorded and it'll be available online tomorrow and it'll also be emailed to you. So if you want to share it with friends or family or coworkers, you're absolutely welcome to do that. Um, and if at any point the screen freezes or something just doesn't seem right, um, you can just close out the whole thing, go back to that email that you were just at to open the program up and just reopen it and that should get you back to where you need to be. Um, but if you have technical questions, you can also send a question in, in the chat box and I'll try and help you out if I can. Um, we are going to have two additional conversations that Chad is organizing, one in September and one in October. So keep an eye out uh, for those. We're going to be exploring different topics sort of related to this um, and it's going to be equally awesome. So. I'm really grateful to Chad and to all the panelists who are going to be joining us. Um, and, and Sharon Gary Smith is going to be here. She was feeling a little sick to her stomach, but she'll be here in about 15 minutes or 10 minutes. So I'm really excited that she's going to join us. Um, and without any further delay, I'll just pass it over to Chad. Awesome. Good evening, everybody, and, and welcome. And thank you very much uh, for coming on board here to hear this wonderful, uh, beautiful, rich conversations that's going to be taking place in the next uh, few minutes or next hour and a half. Um, yeah, I just wanna just, you know, just to say a little bit about myself and what uh, Jamie has uh, shared that, you know, my name is Chad Brown. Again, to those who don't know me, I'm the president and founder of Soul River Inc. Um, where our mission is really, you know, we bring uh, at-risk youth, uh, youth of color, diversity backgrounds, et cetera, and merge them with uh, veterans onto our public lands, um, you know, and we, our ultimate goal from a veteran standpoint and an organization standpoint is to raise our youth into leaders for tomorrow, to be able to take a stand on public land, take a stand for wildlife, our fresh water, uh, to be able to use their voice and tell their story and also learn how to advocate on, on the special things that we find Oz that we all partake in the outdoor and we find out what's amazing, what nature provides. Uh, so I just want to, you know, um, Asked everyone to you know really lean in. This is this is a, a treat of what uh, been able to pull together. Uh, Mr. Wayne Hubbard and Sherry Gary Smith. Um, they both come to the table with some really rich backgrounds that are tied to our public lands, and we're going to engage into a really awesome uh, storytelling conversation uh, that's going to be also directed with a couple questions added in there. Uh, to help navigate to move the conversation forward. Um, but the, I would take that uh, you guys are gonna really uh, find uh, some really rich points of information that's spoken from a different lens um, and, 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 and from a different life, basically, you know, uh, especially being African-American in the outdoors uh, and as we move through not just our urban world, also our outdoor world. So I'm going to take a step back and allow Mr. Wayne Hubbard to kind of uh, use this uh, time to introduce himself and, and he's gonna share a little bit about uh, the work that he does and um, yeah, take it away, Wayne. All right, all right, all right. Give everybody a little shout, a little love out there in, in the, the virtual world. Um, I'm Wayne Hubbard. I am the host and co-founder of Urban American Outdoors. Urban American Outdoors was founded in 1998. And what, what we saw was, there was not very many images of people of color in the outdoors. And if you saw us, we were an afterthought. And so 
we decided to create Urban American Outdoors to show positive images of people of color in the outdoors. And with that being the case, uh, we started a TV show in 20, uh, 2003. I've aired since, since then. Uh, and what's, what has happened is it took off and just ran everywhere. And so we've won over 75 national, international awards for program and four time Emmy nominated. But with that being the case, um, what happened with that is that we realized there were opportunities that people of color wasn't getting. So we created Urban Kids Fish and Urban Kids Fish is this program that we go around and we do fishing programs, but it's fishing with a purpose. We, we do it where we're engaging youth uh, to connect to nature, but we also bring in people to talk about career and career opportunities in this space, talk about the science, talk about uh, engaging them to connect to nature as advocates and stewards. Um, and what makes it really important is it's just not about the kids. We talk about the whole family as a whole. One of the other things that's happened since we started Urban American Outdoors is I've been honored uh, to be uh, nominated as one of the champions of change and been invited to the White House. I also sit on uh, several uh, congressional, I sit on a FACA uh, of the top leaders and I get to talk to, give recommendations to the secretaries on what I think is important about engaging diverse audience to connect to nature. What, what I think is really relevant about that is you think about it, you know, when you think about outdoors, we were really not a thought process in that. You know, we went out there, but it always seems that we were an afterthought. So I'm in, in there advocating and trying to promote uh, this important space that we have, a, we have a stake and we are part of the, the narrative of the outdoors. Um, one of the things that I really like about that is being able to sit at the table and say, hey, there's a whole nother group of individuals that really need to be part uh, of this narrative, you know, and so that's really important. So I sit on the Hunting Shooting Sports Conservation Council. Hey, there she is. <laughs> I sit on the uh, Hunting Shooting Sports Conservation Council. I sit on the Diverse Joint Venture, and what that is is a joint venture that is um, designed, and we sit and work with uh, Department of Interior. USDA, Forest Service, National Parks, uh, BLM, and our focus is to have engage them in looking at diverse candidates for jobs. Uh, I'm also uh, sit on the Northeast Recreation Rack with the Forest Service where we advise them on how people recreate on public lands. But most importantly that what I think is uh, my focus is showing outdoors from a different perspective, showing history. So with our show that we do, we not only do we do that, but we engage stories that typically you don't hear. And we also engage the fact that all people were part of the narrative when it comes to outdoors. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna stop there and I'm, I'm gonna pass the mic over to Mrs. Smith. <laughs> I think we can hear her, Jamie. Yeah, Sharon, we can't quite hear you. It says that your microphone's on. Let's see here. All right, can you try again? Okay. Are you on the same computer you were on yesterday? Yes. Shoot. Okay, maybe try closing out and then coming back in one more time. That worked for Wayne earlier. Yeah, Sharon, maybe if you can try just closing out the whole thing and then op reopening it, maybe that will, will work for you. I don't think she can hear. Oh, okay. 
Let's try. Cool. Let's Wayne, see we had a couple of pictures of yours that we didn't get to. If you wanted right, to, so, speak to, to, oh to yeah, them. most definitely. Hey, um, yeah, I, uh, Jamie, uh, if you can go back to that uh, Calvary picture of Wayne uh, shot uh, with the, um, I think it'd be really interesting, Wayne. You can share about that, especially so, uh, like veterans, et cetera. Okay, so so one of the things that we that. I'm really proud of. I am a member of the National Association of Ninth and Tenth uh, Horse Cavalry Buffalo Soldiers Association. And this picture right here, we did a piece uh, honoring uh, the Buffalo Soldiers. And we told about the history and the great legacy of these men who, uh, some of them were slaves before they be got into the army. And so this show was done in Kansas and then we went uh, and went to Fort Leavenworth where they were founded and did a piece with Colin Powell. So this right here is one of uh, a series of pictures, actually a, a TV show that we did, award-winning TV show um, that honored the legacy. Uh, it, it was just rewarding to be there and also rewarding to be uh, on the, the, the place where they were founded. Just that the history is so rich. Um, one of the things that was really also amazing, most people think of the Buffalo Soldiers in pastime from the the 18, you know, the, the, the 1865 and up, but the Buffalo Soldiers were physically here until segregation, when, you know, they desegregated uh, the army. So some of the last Buffalo Soldiers fought in World War II and, uh, and actually actually some of them uh, rolled into, some of the last units rolled into uh, Korea, I think, is, is some of the last historical pieces that we can find that was considered Buffalo Soldiers. So, yeah, it's just it was just rewarding to be able to do that and talk about this great legacy and realizing most people don't know that the Buffalo Soldiers were some of the first forest rangers and some of the first park rangers. So mm -hmm. think about right. this. They were protecting they were protecting the West. So it's it was just really rewarding. Uh, my understanding that you were sharing with me earlier about uh, through, I think it was through the Buffalo Rangers that uh, you done some work with Colin Powell. Yeah, so so the work that we did with Colin Powell, we actually did a show with him about the Buffalo Soldiers at Fort Leavenworth, and then in 2014, 2015, they honored him, and he is actually the only living person that has a bus. We had to uh, mm. get with the military. Uh, and there is a circle of firsts in Fort Leavenworth. And so we were able to film in Fort Leavenworth a second show, and he was honored in the circle of firsts. So it, it was it, very, very powerful yeah, to be there. Awesome. And, oh, yes. That's great. That's, 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 a, that's an awesome piece of history, and a lot of people don't know, you know, um, you know, because I know that the Buffalo Soldiers, there was some, also that played a role in, like the old school we were talking about earlier about the mountain biking, you know, and, and the bikes. Mm -hmm. We can talk about that a little bit later. I just want, I hope Sharon, Sharon, can you hear us? Can we? I can hear you. Can awesome. you hear me? Hear you. All yeah. right, all right, all right. <laughs> Drop right. the mic. Drop the mic. I'm so, I'm so fascinated by that picture. That's wow. awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. So, folks, we have Sharon Gary Smith here. And Sharon, would you please go ahead and just, uh, introduce yourself and share a little bit and before we start, please. I'm Sharon Gary Smith. I was born and reared in Portland, Oregon, native Oregonian. I am the first of the four daughters, uh, privileged to be daughters of Frederick Douglass Gary Jr. and Bobby Lou Mosley Gary, who were black pioneers, I suppose, the Go West, Go West movement. My father was a Tuskegee man, came from Virginia. His roots are Hampton, Virginia, Newport News, went to Tuskegee and then came west to Oregon. My mother was an Okie from Muskogee who was raised in Kansas City. Wow. She too wow. came west. And the idea was to build a life, to bring their skills. And when I think now that my father, his graduation, his papers, were topography hmm. and um, and so when I think of the study of the land, he understood land elevation. All of that now really resonates with me 
where he would take us, the idea of going on the land in Oregon, going around, being able to see things from a higher viewpoint and how he matched that to our life. You know, wow. you're not, if you look at this picture, the reason I just picked it last night, this is the Oregon I've always known. I'm the mm. little one in the middle and my mother used to remind me that though I have always been vertically challenged, my sense of myself was always based upon my view of the world. When I mm. look and see that these young women, one of them who was taller than my mother, this is 1956, I was like eight years old, but I had been skipped from fourth grade to sixth grade. These were my peers. But my mother said I was always the soloist. Hmm. And the reason that picture became significant last night is being born and re reared in Oregon. These are the kinds of images that set my view of myself in the world is that I've always been the little one who stands out because I don't look like the majority of the rest of them. But I was always placing my stake down and being who I could be based on what my parents told me. And when they took us out and on the land, this picture may not be that intelligible, but that is Frederick and Bobby skiing uh, up at a ski lodge, uh, 1946, 1947, two years before I was born. This wow. idea of going out, elevation, going out on the land, appreciating the beauty of the land, staying in a space where you're actually communing with nature. They assumed they had the right to that and they acted on that. And they also raised us four girls to go out, to be able to appreciate, to steward. This is in snowshoes with snow up to our knees, Mount Bachelor in Southern Oregon, 1950s. I mean, it was wow. so much snow, we, I could have been lost <laughs> in, in, in the, the snow. It came. Um, but we were out there and you might see a person behind me. We were out there and it was us and everybody else. Mm -hmm. And um, I was always conscious of that, but I was never immobilized by that. Although people often ask us, why were we there? Why are you out here? What are you doing so far from where they assumed we belonged? And it was always, this is our land. This is our Oregon. Uh, we own this just like you. I don't think we recognize some of the dangers of what they might have said or done to us because we had Fred and Bobby back there covering our backs. Um, this framed my life. It really did. Um, the sense of land and the history of African Americans stewarding the land, being responsible for restoration way before it became a thing, planting and bringing in the crops, not just when we were indentured and enslaved, but always appreciating the bounty of land, that public lands are our lands, that we have a right to fish to hunt if we choose, to manage ourselves around the land, to go into places, to see new vistas. That was so embedded by my parents. And I think because we were girls, I just wanna say that in closing, that we were young black girls that my father taught what you might assume you just teach boys. And um, I can't, fish or hunt with the best of them. I don't lasso anything other than people and try <laughs> to pull them to my way of thinking. So I've tried to apply some of that, you know, you catch, you put back, or as my new cousin says, you catch and you cook, but only what you need, that you restore land, you try not to leave your footprint, but you have a right as anybody else to be in appreciation of it and to use it. That's awesome. That's awesome, Sharon. Thank you. Uh, thank you both uh, for sharing, and, and you, you ended it really, really well. That uh, that's going to give into my next question to the both of you. Um, you know, I've, I've seen certain comments out there, and certain people say, 
um, you know, from, you know, public lands, it, it is for everyone. And I don't understand why we have to make this a conversation of, of African Americans, you know, uh, in, in their way of things with public lands, because it's the same, you know, and it's not the same. And so I want to dive into this conversation here. And the question basically um, that I will ask you to is what does public lands uh, mean to you? And what is your connection, uh, personal in history and family? And please uh, feel free to share your lens um, of, of what these, what the question I proposed to you, please go for it. Yeah. All right. So Sharon, do you want to start? Or do you want me to hit it? I would appreciate if you would, since I have to pace myself <laughs> differently after my little today. Okay. <laughs> so, so public lands to me are government lands that are, that are, they are lands that are managed by the government. And, um, and, you know, when, when I think about them, that you have access to. So you think about the refuges, you think about national parks, you think about BLM lands. I think about it from that perspective, but also from talking about, from a historical standpoint, realizing that a lot of these spaces and places, when they were being marked up, cut up for forest lands, national parks, we we weren't part of the we weren't part of the thought process when, when that was there. We wasn't part of that that narrative. Now dealing with my family, most people might not know this, but I, I'm tribal. I'm Cherokee Freedman, mm -hmm. and with dealing with that, you know, and it's it's on both sides of my family. It's on my grandmother and father's side, but I was always taught about the land. We we own land and. We looked at it and we utilized the land, not only to fish and hunt and for food and raise that, but I was also taught about the respect, to respect the land. Um, and one of the things that really hits home to me when I think about this as, as uh, think about the question, um, my family, you know, I'm a descendant from Black Wall Street. Our family had a store there. And I think about the stories that we were told and and the stories that we were not told because they told us not to, they told them not to talk about it. But imagine that you had built this wealth and being, uh, you know, Cherokee Freedmen built this wealth, having a store and for them to come and take it overnight and for you to be put in a concert and, and walk. So I always think about what my grandmother used to tell me. When it, when it came to this about ownership and our family owned a big a plot of land. Uh, and she would always tell me, you know, they can take everything from you, but your head is not a just a hat rack. I want you to put something in it and do something with it. And so that is stuck with me. So that's why when I'm advocating for people in the public lands, when I'm advocating uh, for young people to engage and experience this, when I'm advocating for them to have jobs in this space, uh, that's why it's relevant to me. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a deeper thought process. Right on, thank you. I think for me, you touched on it, Chad, with the question that people say, why do you think we have to engage about Black people and public lands, this assumption based on how others, whites, understand and recognize the privilege of access, the privilege of movement, the right, but in so many ways, just like we could not go to certain drinking fountains, what our forebears had to bear. And I mean, all the way up into the 60s, because the Civil Rights Act is 1965, when it was actually ratified in Congress. Mm -hmm. And we know the difference in paper and people's actions. And so that we were prohibited from entering spaces that are set aside by the federal government to enjoy, to explore, to relax, to rest on, we were prohibited and there was danger for us. And going on land, going far away, going into spaces and places, as you saw my father and mm -hmm. where he brought his daughters and where other families, whether it was the Oregon coast in the case of Oregon or Southern Oregon, 
or in the mountains or on trails, you know, they say off the bike trails, mm -hmm. we had to worry about the danger of others who ask, why are you here? And there are a lot of ways that people show you you're not welcome. And then there's the enforcement of laws that prohibited, restricted, and confined us to where we could easily go and travel and be safe. Mm -hmm. And so I think that when you don't have to think that, it's easy to assume that, of course, you have access. There are a number of ways to physically restrain you, to condemn you, to not be a part of, and there are emotional and mental ways that in society you show us who is and who is not welcome. And so we had those two coming, those coming together. And for us to be asked to be stopped, um, to go onto lands where it is not safe, I would just close this part for me by saying in this moment in 2020, all over the world, Portland, anywhere in this country, ever since March 25th, we've seen Black Lives Matter is more than a tagline. It's a movement for stopping the brutality, but the repression of our spirit and our right to enjoy the benefits of a country that we have paid it forward in and that we actually want to live. I want to go, I want to see, I want to photograph, I want to touch, I want to sit in the federal spaces that my taxes and my family have always said I had a right to. We've been paying for others to enjoy what we've been paying for. Mm -hmm. And so I think not knowing it, I understand it. Absolutely no one can say they don't understand that there is a movement for a justice that'll allow us to choose. Right. Yeah. Wow. Well, Chad, Chad mm -hmm. I want to, I want to, I want to chip in here because she just brought yeah. something that was very, right. very relevant. A lot of people don't realize a lot of these public spaces, they would have no access, or they would have Negro Day in the park, or they mm -hmm. would have things that were slated just for us, and. When you think about the Civil Rights Bill, you think about Martin Luther King, the Civil Rights Bill also included us going to these public spaces that we have That's access, right. that we don't right. have to have a day in the park. But <laughs> one of the other things that was very relevant about this is there were people of color working in these segregated spaces. You know, I, I think about uh, a, a good friend of mine, her, you know, her family, uh, Deidre uh, Tut, her family was in the Shenandoah Mountains and, and working in this place, but it was segregated. Now, yeah. you think about the Shenandoah Mountains, that's the Waltons, <laughs> but you didn't never see any one person of color on the Waltons. And speaking of the Shenandoah, on the Shenandoah Mountains, and you mentioned yeah. earlier about being Native American, to a lot of people don't know that there are such things of Black Native Americans. A absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely 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 yeah and so yeah. so i just i just think that's relevant for people to realize you know they wonder why people are so uptight well you know a lot of the people that are going out and recreating are they have grandmothers grandfathers that when the jim crow was still going they that's were right. nervous about it so that's inbred it you know i think about and i'm gonna pass this over after i say it, i think about uh my grandmother would when i would go out hunting and fishing she would tell me she said and she would always have this quote but it just didn't resonate until i got older she would say the forest the forest and the woods have a lot of trees and rope is cheap i want mm. you to be careful yeah yeah and so mm. but she didn't tell me not to go but she gave me the awareness yeah. and taught me to respect and be aware of my surrounding. So if I did run into something, so that's just something that, that stuck to me. And I, I even today, so, but yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll pass it back to you, Chad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate you both uh, sharing that. And it, it, I resonate with a lot and it brings up uh, some of my childhood. Uh, you know, I, I don't, uh, 
you know, just to share a little bit, I, um, you know, when I, where I was, where I come from, I come from Texas and I come from a family of farmers and hunters, you know, and, you know, my grandpa, you know, he, 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 you know, he was hard on his hands and he used to build these fences, barbed wire fences, et cetera. And I used to kind of tag along with them, you know, and I grew up with the stories of, uh, you know, that I'm hearing that you guys are speaking about, you know, and, but my upbringing in that back country with my family, you know, in small little town of Quero, Texas, my dad used to take me to the, uh, to the black rodeo, you know, and we would go to the black rodeos and my father mm-hmm. used to wrestle bulls, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, and it was like a pastime, you know, it was my father and all the other, his other brothers, and they would get out on a Sunday afternoon and get into the pastor. And it was kind of like our way, but the one I'm sharing is, uh, is that that was like my little protective world. You know, uh, and I, I was not really aware, but my father and my mom and grandpa and grandma and everybody, they used to, you know, kind of like warn me, you know, uh, don't go too far. Oh, that's that's when you if you pass that land, if you pass that landmark, you know, that's, yes. that's white man's land, you know, and mm-hmm. you need to be careful. So this is where this is our land. You need to stay right here, you know, and my you know, and so they would tell me this all the time. But, you know, it, I guess it didn't really rest. I mean, racism is one thing we grow up, but I think the more I, I did start a journey outdoors more growing up, I start seeing a lot of that, what my mom and my dad and everybody was trying to tell me, you know, and, and, and it was that generational fear. But part of it is, is the history and, and then part of it is me moving forward through life. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm seeing that. I experienced that. You know, and uh, it it, it kind of doesn't matter how well versed you are in the outdoors. You, there's a fear there, you know. And uh, but I appreciate the both you guys sharing it because, yeah, you guys throwing out some history, Jim Crow laws, <laughs> everything. You know, and it's, it's something I wasn't even, I wasn't even part of at that time. I don't think I was even thought of at that time, you know. But but I totally uh, it's 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 important and and to lean into this conversation. My next question that goes into uh, access and safety. Um, talk to me about the importance of access and safety and how does that resonate with you? Because I, you know, as I said earlier from last time we talked and I'll share with everybody, access and safety that ties into this book that I found, which is the Negro Motorist, the Green Book. I, you know, this is something new to me and it was really interesting uh, that, you know, the, that uh, of what it tells about uh, the passages that African-Americans had to take to travel, you know, to one location to a different location in order to stay safe, you know. And so tell me about what you guys think in such this book is you guys are familiar with this book as well. But carry on. Please feel free to jump in. So Sharon, you go on. I, I think what's so powerful about the green book is when people start off on any adventure, you typically plan it out. You have some sense of where you want to go from here to there. And you have stops and places along the way for refreshments, for a stretch break, to engage, to see the sights. That's kind of the way people travel. For travelers who have to add that extra layer, My father and mother had four little girls and they wanted us to not be encumbered by restrictions. But my father was responsible as most parents are for safety and passage. So we knew about the green book. This was before (laughs) GPS because it was your GPS or you didn't get off on the wrong road in the wrong place. But more importantly, it tells you about there's danger, danger mm-hmm. out there. And the danger wasn't from the animals. It was from the human species. Right. Those right. who believe that we have no right to be there. Towns in Oregon that had sunset laws that you'd better not be here at sunset. Passing from Portland and down through Oregon to get to California and beyond. We knew you gassed up in Eugene, it was in the book. You gas up and you best not stop in Medford, Grants Pass, Ashland till you crossed over the mountains into Wairika, California. Mm. And the fact that you could be stopped 
And even more recently here in Oregon, there were young men pulled off of Greyhound buses and elder men, we're talking about in the last 10 years, 15 years beaten, where others watched in shock and dismay, but the law enforcement did not come to do anything, but you shouldn't have been here. And so the book was almost giving you a place of shelter, places that had been identified and had been proven to be safe so that you could continue your journey unscathed. And I hope that for those who are listening to you, the idea of safe passage through federal lands, through public lands, it, it's almost like you're in a land that's unsafe that is your land. Mm. And to learn to be expansive and to be joyful and to look forward to these amazing trips across the country. But there are places where, as, as Wayne's talking about grandma, you best not go there or mm. don't take that route or make sure somebody knows that you're coming this way so they can look out for you. That wow. is how we survived. Entertainers wow. used the Green Book. Mm -hmm. There are hotels in Portland that were identified. That's the place you stay and no place else will accept you. And Portland and throughout this state, throughout this country, that book uh, was updated. As we told you, the paper went out. But mm -hmm. this is how we were able to navigate not just rough terrain, but dangerous spaces where we were treated like we were alien, unknown, foreign, and other. And wow. so I'm thankful that my mother, that was before the AAA triptych. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> Wayne, so, I so love how I look at this, and, and I like to explain this because um, I, I had a huge conversation about this. The Green Book is Yelp for black people for safety before that before there was Yelp. Mm. And right. most people, yeah, so most people look at it like, what the green book? Well, think of it as Yelp. And you had to figure out from destination A, A to Z, and there's some bumps on the road. Mm. Um, so I look at it from that perspective. Uh, and so that would give people a resonation of what we're talking about with the Green Book. What's what's so important about that is I think about it, my, my wife's uh, family would do RV trips across the country. And we were going through some boxes and we got some of the original Green Books and they would they would refresh them and re reissue them, you know, periodically. So they would update because this space might change or the ownership might change. So when I was thinking of looking at it and talking about it, we went back and pulled up some records and come to find out my father-in-law's house when they lived in Topeka, Kansas, was a, a safe place to wow. stay. Wow. For a degree. So. Wilt Chamberlain stayed there. Frankie Lyman was there. Wow. Uh, and, and so we've got pictures, uh, you know, things of that nature. So it resonated really important because I right, think about this, if you look back at it and we found, we found uh, a kind of a journal of her grandmother had wrote where, what, where they were gonna go and where they, where they were gonna stop. And some of it was you had to go 50 miles out the way just yes. to be safe. Now think about that. Today we would go like that doesn't make sense. Or you better not go over there to Jimmy's Jigger. Now I know he got some good food, but you not better not stop at Jimmy Jiggers because mm -hmm. that's not safe. Mm -hmm. So that's really what what the Green Book to me is. It is the it is the prelude to Yelp, where the you can go in and of the black. Country. Yeah, for for yeah. for African Americans. Now, yeah. ironically, here's here's the, here's the, the amazing thing about that. Latinos use the Green Book because uh -huh. it was safe. Yeah, there yeah. was Native Americans that were also in that space that mm. this overlap. So, so when you think about it, someone saw the need to build in safety for travel. 
And again, I'm going to bring back a lot of this was a lot of this was dealt around the Jim Crow laws where it was segregated and not being able to drink, you know, not drinking at these different fountains. I, I think about now think about this. This this will this will hit home resonate about this. Think about John Lewis, who was riding on the bus and uh, got pulled out and he you know got got beat up and arrested for drinking at a fountain. Yes. That was part of the that was part of the narrative of and that was a proven why it wasn't safe. You you think about it, think about it as simplistic as a drink of hot water out of a faucet, out of a, a fountain. And so that's what the Green Book in, in essence. Now, what's really powerful about that is, think about the person or the people that put that together that says, we found a need to help our people. That's just right. powerful. That's just powerful. Right. That's yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that's really powerful, and it's it's amazing for for someone who who thought about that, you know. And access and safety is 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 important for us all, you know. And uh, um, and you know that it, well to you guys in those travels of African Americans at the time was there travels that extended into uh, back country, wild spaces? Are you familiar with anything, or I don't know. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I'll use one for instance, dealing with hunting and fishing. Now, I, I tell people I, I am not that old, but I do with the work that I do with the TV show, I do a lot of research because I talk about historical places and relevancy. Realizing there were, there are 70 and 80 year old hunting, black hunting clubs that are out yes. there. Yes. Hmm. And Part of that, part of that is, I'll, I'll think about a club here that's called the Triple S Sportsman Club, that they were African American doctors and, and and lawyers, and every year from Kansas City, they would go to Colorado or Montana hunting. Mm -hmm. Now imagine you in the fifties, that you got to figure out a space and a place. Right. Not only got to figure out a space and a place, you got to figure out a, in back country <laughs> to go hunting. Right. And and you got to navigate the laws. So, yes, that is something that is is very relevant. Or think about I think about there was a large group of people that RV like your family Sharon that went to the Yellowstones, that went went to these different places. Mm -hmm. That in essence, when they would go out there, they would, you know, you know, hey, we got the right to be out there too. Hold up. We got our day or so. We got a week or so uh, to go out there and experience it. So that was part of it. And so what was really amazing is looking at, physically looking at the notes that my, uh, it would be my uh, wife's gra uh, grandmother's uh, journal, looking at that and looking at the, the hashes that she would write. It was really complicated. and they thought about the process. Yeah, yeah. So, I bet it was. So, 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 yeah. No, no, no. I, I was just saying. I was just. I, I was thinking about that process. And you know, when you go out and hunt today, there's a whole lot of regulations and all this kind of stuff you got to go yeah. through. So I can't imagine. You know, how would you navigate backcountry, public land, space, etc., under those times when you you're not just a threat but you're walking through the woods with a rifle <laughs> yeah. you know well, and, 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 and you don't got google you don't right. got google right you can't right. you can't right <laughs> yeah and i think you, that you know, what it just, also raises is the regulations you're talking about all the necessary paperwork but the claims my father who my mother discouraged his hunting with four <laughs> daughters you know, we can't afford to lose you, Red Winter. And you know good and well, you'll be suspected of being the one who pulled the gun out as opposed to hunting like others. I listen to these conversations. What do you mean you want to take us, you know, off here? What do you mean you want to just hunt? We'll just recreate. We don't mm. need you to, we'll fish. Mm. We don't need you to be walking around with a gun, even though it's broken down and over your arm 
because people could be suspicious. And we know now how if they are fearful, that's the new tag, I feared for my life, mm. then they didn't say that then. Mm. But to be asked, where's your permit? Where's your fishing permit? And my father would say, but I, you didn't ask all the other folks lying in the banks. And yet wow. we knew that there was the day you come up and you approach the one black family out of 20 folks down here, all these men and folks down here on the banks, but you come and you ask, and of course your paper had to always be intact. And so what that says is I'm doing enforcement of you, not just the law. I'm enforcing, I'm telling you that you're suspect. And I can tell you, get out of here, however you speak to me or however I interpret it. So it's all of these things that inhibit and restrict our ability to freely explore and be on the land using it in the right ways. You know, my father knew about catch and put back. My father looked, knew about don't take more than you can really need. We knew all those things, conservation and thoughtfulness, but the assumption is that we're somehow gonna harm, gonna damage, we're not gonna mm -hmm. leave it better than when we found it. Uh, and that kind of implicit bias, it's not just enough to have a law, it's who enforces it and what do they look like? And do they represent anything familiar? And so we're still dealing with that. In fact, the resurgence of concern about restricting and confining us. Mm -hmm. uh, there are places in Oregon now that I remember what it was like to pass through them. And there are not very many places in Oregon. I haven't been, thanks to my dad and my mom, from Bend to Ontario, to, you know, that mm -hmm. I still remember danger danger radar that we developed as young girls that they're asking too many questions they're following us they're wandering down to the banks to look at us which creates a certain maybe you need to pack up and go home that i don't think that that was unintentional that's intentional so so can i can i chime in chime in on that go ahead as a, as a person who i do a show i film that happens today. That just doesn't. Exactly. I was about to say that. I was about to say that. that. Yeah. Happen, that happens today. Absolutely. Um, I actually did a a series in Montana, and I was fishing with a guide, and the agent federation showed up, and I'm used to that. I'm used to showing my license, and the guy said, "I've never seen an agent." He said, I've never seen an agent, but he showed up three other times after that. By the fourth time, the guy who happened to be white said, what's wrong with you? So those two got into it, but I knew I had to be the wisdom in it because if something went down, it they ain't going to look at anybody but, but me. And, and, and that's just real talk. So that happens today. Yeah, absolutely. one of the things that yeah, one of the things I think and, and Chad Chad does this all the time. One of the best things that I can have is be all my pre-planning, my pre-research, having right. all that in place. Right. Uh, the one thing I like about Chad is I love the fact when he does the work with the kids, man, listen, you you've done your research times times 10 because that, that it's the same Absolutely. type of work that I do when I do my my youth fishing derbies you know mm -hmm. I, I'm taking three to four hundred kids fishing mm -hmm. at a given time yeah so believe me and they look like a little UN <laughs> believe me <laughs> they looking at me really serious and that's yeah. that's now and so so the key thing is is your pre-planning and being aware. So sometimes that might be make me call call the uh, you know the managing district and say, "Hey, I'm going to be out here. I want you to be aware." Blah blah blah. So yeah. some of that is, and I I know we don't we shouldn't have to do it, but that's just real talk. 
you're right. We 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 shouldn't have to do it. And I appreciate you bringing that up. But you're absolutely right. I do do my pre planning <laughs> to make it. You know, because you know, there's just there's a lot of lives at stake, right? When we're going on our deployments, we got a lot of youth of color. We got veterans. Uh, we got yeah. you know in that mix. You break it down: women, young girls. Uh, you know, I. You know what? I, I may be you call me being hyper vigilant, but I have to do my due diligence and do the right research of the area that we're going into. Um, because you know the worst case situation that we have never encountered, and I don't want to counter, but it's always that 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 resistance, you know, of going in the outdoors and you're dealing with somebody, you know, I hate to forget the movie, but like the deliverance movie and everything, you know, but someone acting crazy and they don't want us here, you know. And so I, I got to do the research in order to even come up with an exit strategy, plan strategy B, plan strategy C, plan strategy D, you know, and, you know, I got to plan that all out and play those scenarios out because now for me, it's, it's more than just me. I got, there's, there's 20 some lives right here, you know, uh, and back, you know, and, and, uh, and, and, you know, and I don't want, nothing bad to happen and the reality is that there there's we we still deal today with the racism you know the hate the ignorance it's it's everywhere you know and, and it's sad to say it's learned you know if some Absolutely. people are born with the families and the mom and dad speak about this they they the the, the, the n-word is loose off their mouth and et cetera, and they grow up and so this stuff is this is it's learned and 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 uh we have to do our very best uh to unlearn it you know and to make places much more well, safe can, you know? yeah yeah can, and can i say part of that part of that is because i i talk about it a lot and you know i don't want people out there thinking hey we, we just talking about it's unsafe and going it's part of that is is the symptoms of policy not being right. set up or regulations right. not being set up. So when we're getting treated out, that's a symptom because people realize that if there's no cause and effect, if you didn't do anything, they're not going to, you know, if they can act a fool and not get away with it, you know, if they can get away with it, uh, then it, so part of that is not having regulations, not having, uh, you know, things in place to say, and tell people that we're part of this space. Right. One of the other thing. One of the other things that that I always tell a person, we can we can fight about, you know, the symptoms, or we can fix the problems. So that's that's going in and making sure there's policy, talking with the the, the land managers, saying, right. hey, we have to do something because that's really where where this this lie. Um, and think about it, going back to going back to when the lands these public lands were put together we wouldn't have thought but you would think over a hundred years someone would have thought that they need to do something right. and so that's really where i i fight because one of the things you hear a lot is you hear this is your forest this is your park come out and experience the public lands this is this and they've said this over but when we now we showing up yeah and now the land manager don't know how to deal with it because they haven't been taught cultural relevance right so it's like and i always like to explain it it's like you having a party and it's that that neighbor you've been inviting every year you know he ain't gonna come you know he ain't gonna come right but this year he shows up with him and five of his friends and they acting a fool and you wasn't prepared for it one yeah. of the things is you can't tell us to come and not give us prepares for the for us to get, come out there because now we're showing up you know we're showing up and and we're yeah. and it's just not black people it's just not hispanic people it's just asian there are all people that are coming up and no one's told them hey if you're coming out here the rules are different from city parks state parks federal lands federal refuges and mm -hmm. so people are coming out there and they're, and they're just you know they're just coming out because not everybody that comes out there is a conservationist. They're just coming out to recreate, right. you know? And so I always tell a person, that's one of the issues that we have. And that's why you see people out there talking about, I'm going to take a selfie with the buffalo. All of us know the buffalo ain't your friend. Doing that. Let's see if he's being chased by bison. Let's see who's stepping into the hot springs at Yellowstone. 
Let's see yeah. who's defying at trying over barriers, pushing yeah. beyond, and yet the punishment and the assumption, not all white people are marauders and instigators, yeah, yeah. but right. enough yeah. are, but it's not cultural is what they tell us. But for mm -hmm. us, one or two, it's all y'all, as my friends would say in Georgia. And I think what you said that was so critical, policy is paper. Well, policy well, is paper. The enforcement, the transference go. of who gets to make policy, who is the new appearance, who's out there to greet you, to direct you, remind you of regulation. Does it look like not the changing, the already change demographics of this country? of this space, of any state? Does it take into recognition how many more people are learning and want to access and have the opportunity until all of that is understood? Because the ads and the messages, they were intended for the audience that historically has been the audience. That's why when they say, we want you all to come out here, we understood, my mother says, that's code. Used to say, that's, that's dog whistle, that's code. We want you all to come. We want you to take advantage of the bounty. There was a very narrow group that that really was intended for. Mm -hmm. So until we change not just the message, but the policies are actually named, we are able to proceed and have more people looking like the variety, the difference, the di diverse people in this country. When I hear it from somebody that I recognize, wow, just like others get to do. Hmm. We're gonna transform this. We're in a really dangerous period right now. I, I wanna close mine by saying, this is the time of repression and regression. And the yeah. fight is to not roll back to the way it used to be because the good old way it used to be did not serve many of us. Hmm. Well, one of the things that I, that I think is also re relevant is you have if you're going to tell us out you have to prepare the land manager you have to right now they're they're in an influx because even they're nervous about what's going on because with the COVID, there are more people going out to these natural spaces and you know i think about some of these natural spaces that are also getting they're, they're getting tore up and mm. you know overrun. You also have to, yeah. yeah you're getting overrun so you also have to think about that one of the one of the other things that are that is really relevant to me is some of these land managers need to be diverse and look like us they need to see that. people in these spaces that look like us right uh, at engaging them uh, i i think that's a very very important piece the 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 issue that i that i see today is certain people think they have ownership to the public lands and it's yeah. theirs and yeah. they're going like well why why, why are you here and, yeah. and, and that's really hard. I tell you, one of the, the craziest things that, that I've ever heard was I sit in this big, large council with the top leaders. And I sit in there and, and they made the statement, well, you know, black people really just been going in the outdoors for the last 12 to 10 years. We're seeing groups. And I'm like, and I, I, I'm just lost with that. Yeah. It's, not that. it's not that we don't go in the outdoors. We just don't recreate with you. That's, that's right. the issue. That's the issue. So, so now that you're seeing social media and, and you're seeing these groups that tell people to go out and recreate, we have to really look at how do we make things not just policy level, but you know the people doing the work to, to realize because some of the people that are land managers have issues too. So, so that and, and I'll pass the mic back to you, Chad. This was wonderful. Yeah. You you guys you guys are laying it. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of richness. Part three. A lot of richness. <laughs> Stay tuned for part three. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. You know, uh, you know, between the Bob and Wayne, you mentioned something about the ownership, you know, and I I I run into that a lot, you know, when, when I'm out there. Um and the I think the 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 pinnacle of my experience that I would share, um, which I would never forget. Um, Sharon, you, you familiar with this water I'm about to tell you, but I was actually on the Clackamas River uh, and I was fly fishing and I was, I'm, I'm blessed, I'm lucky, uh, and I think I had some angels 
on each side of me, helping me through this process. Um, but there, I had an encounter on the Clackamas River, um, a white man uh, drew his weapon and sound off two warning shots towards me and told me to get off my river. I uh, guess, yeah, I've seen some crazy stuff like that. Yeah, you know, uh, and I've seen it, get off my river. Get off my river. You know, and you know what? I, I, it's, it's, it's. This is where, and I know, I think I'm, I'm feeling connecting with you guys on this because. You know, as we all are soldiers and, and we have we carry a lot of wounds going through our life of being black in America with a lot of hate and racism is coming at us. You know, we, we have learned how to adapt to that and being able to, you know, do this number here and keep on moving with prayer, keep on moving with prayer. Even the gunshots doesn't move me away. I'm still here and I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to do this number here and keep on going. But what sticks with me is the ownership of it's my ownership. river that's what sticks with me you know and that's probably the most most biggest heaviest piece that it still boggles my mind that this is a flowing river through public lands <laughs> but 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 in his mind but in his mind he has ownership and the yeah. reason that a lot of times that he has ownership is because he can't resonate that he's ever seen anyone African American in the experience. One of the problems that we have today that you see there is the stories that you hear about conservation are the Pinchos or the Teddy Roosevelt's and, and, and the people like that. And that's the, the iconic piece that you hear. But when you really think about it, really think about it, how many stories do you hear of African American or diverse people in nature that has? And we're there, we're mm. we're in this space. Right. So th there's this ownership piece. I'll give you one, for instance, that that that'll that'll hit you. That's not even out in the, out in the outback. It's it's mm. something that just happened to me in 2014. 2014, and I, and and I'm gonna tell you how it is with this space. One of the things I found out with engaging this space, talking about engaging diverse people. Uh, and them wanting to get us in this space, some of the hardest people to deal with are the people that want, said they're looking for uh, diverse people because mm. they have a vision of the diverse person that they're looking for. So mm. I always tell people, you cannot segregate outreach. If you want people in this space, you can't segregate. So in 2014, there was a national convention in Kansas City. This national convention in Kansas City uh was a conservation so the state media person called and said wayne this is amazing we're gonna have all these national people come in they're going to talk about the diversity engagement and all this blah 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 you should be there we want you there so we called the media contact for the national convention they said oh this is wonderful we're, we're having a hard time getting getting the media to show up we're going to send you your forms you fill it out and everything we sent it to her we mailed it off Later that day, we get a call back from the lady. Now she went from being great to not so great. So she calls back and says, Wayne, we got to tell you this. I got to tell you this. It's not me. I got to tell you this. But the, the, the committee behind us said, if you show up with your camera, we're going to call the police and have you arrested for promoting. Now think about what I just said. I have a national TV show. I'm here to promote the good work that you're doing, but you're going to call and have me arrested for doing that. So I told him no. I told him, I said, you know, I'm not going to go there trying to help you guys promote your, what you're trying to do. So a couple of days later, the, the media contact from the state called him and we told him, he said, well, I'll call, let me call it. And so he called back, you guys can come in. So when we showed up, we went up to, to get our, our passes. The whole entire place locked up. They froze up. You know, they gave us our passes, but anybody that we talked to, they done sent out an email. We showed up. Anyway, we talked to with our, with our cameras. They, we got the cold show. So we put. I have my camera crew now. Now think about. It. I I do this for a living. So immediately we said we're gonna we we, we backed up. But 
I said, since we're here, we're going to go to see the keynote speaker. There's 500 people. I walk in the room. The keynote speaker stops the, his, the presentation and says, Wayne and Candy is here. Oh, my God. I've been wanting to see them, blah, blah, blah. So now it's a vortex there. Mm. It's mm. a vortex because they're going like, well, well, I thought they were bad people. They were coming to, to, to get us. So it flipped on them. So, Chad, it that's that ownership. That's that, you know, their perspective of how. So, th and that, again, think about that. That one in the 90s, yeah. that was just six years ago. Wow. That I, so, so you're dealing, so, so it's there, but, you know, like I said, it worked out for the good, but could you imagine showing up and they're going to arrest me for trying to do something good? And that, and right. that's real talk. Yeah. That's real talk. It's so, a counter so narrative. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And so the key thing is the, that gave me, and that's someone, they're going to do that to someone they know. Think about the average person that wants to go out in the outdoors and do this. And, and they're, and, and they didn't, you know, these people knew me in the room. So that's why the work that Chad, you're doing, the other organizations are, are doing to engage people to take, take the change to narrative is so powerful. You know, so I, I tell people that all the time, we have to do more, but we just didn't start 10 years or, or 12 years ago going in the outdoors. Let me give you right. a counter, uh, another part of that narrative. You talked about ownership. We're talking about the idea, the assumption, the presumption of who gets to own Absolutely. and who is an interloper, a problem. Mm -hmm. I my first instinct was, are you talking about this piece of the land right here is yours where we're standing? Are you talking about all the way down the river? I'm going to make it current. Everyone has seen, including your listeners, I'm sure, the presumptive racist, we're calling them Karens and Bills, who walk up to a cost, question, challenge, black people about whether or not you live here can sit here can breathe here can run here because they believe they have ownership the right to decide who gets passage and it's more than just for me the arrogance it also says everything about how racism has been so embedded in the culture that it's harmed us and it's sure has harmed others. They may not see it, but it's limited their sense of things. It has caused policies and practices to not be moved forward. And that white superiority, I say there's nothing superior about it. You have to keep putting somebody else down. We're talking about everybody else can rise. But the fact that you could own the land, own the area, own the space, own the conditions from which we get to pass and move around in the world. It's all come to a head right now. But yeah. well, ownership well, and, and, and the arrogance of it is based on the embedded racism in our society and the lack of cultural knowledge, affirmation, or identity. Mm -hmm. And until mm -hmm. that shift, I talk a lot about right now, every organization, you have all seen it, every organization, whether it's outdoors, association, conservation, Everybody jumped on Black Lives Matter, put up statements, everything is trending, said that it's horrible we stand, but standing requires the business of challenging and changing and opening space. Mm. There's less activity around that. I say solidarity statements, I don't wanna see another one. I wanna see people working to better and to arrive at what this country, even with slave owning, forefathers. I want to see this country go to where it said it wanted to be. Well, I want well, to honor yeah. that. Yeah. Well, and also, and Chad, when you think about dealing with this, this, this natural space, everybody talks in past tense when we talk about people of color. So, we, you know, like for me, I talk about the Buffalo soldiers. I talk about these different individuals. 
when we should. There, there are people today that have done amazing things that no one talks about. No one talks about the Hannibal Boltons who was in Fish and Wildlife Service for 47 years and got a lot of African-Americans engaged in, in this natural world in jobs. Uh, no one talks about the Leslie Weldon who was the highest ranking African-American and woman in the Forest Service as a deputy chief of the, of the, of the, uh, of the uh, I forget what a deputy, she was a deputy chief. Um, no one talks about, now this one's gonna hit you. No one talks about Thurgood Marshall Jr. who right. was on the urban, uh, he, he was on the Fish and Wildlife Foundation for eight years. Now oh, think about it, now, now think about it. Thurgood Marshall, and I tell huh. people that people go like, hold on, don't you think Thurgood Marshall Jr. got something from his dad? And he was, he was on the Fish and Wildlife Foundation, Fish and Wildlife Service, you know, Fish and Wildlife Foundation that's part of Fish and Wildlife Service. So think about that. Think about the, what one degree of separation you have from se you know, desegregation and you know, these rights. Uh, and or, or even today, here, here's another one that, that, that you look at. The, the you know and and that's African American. Think about the the Noemi Lawans that were out there who was fighting internally to get more diverse candidates uh, and diverse programming in the in in the natural space. And even today, regardless of where you're at, think about uh, uh, the new deputy director uh, that we have, Skip with, who's over Fish and Wildlife Service, and she's the first time in history that you got a African-American female running the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, a real you script with. These are people that our public needs to know, and not just, not just black people, not mm -hmm. just, you know, people wonder, I, I, I had the opportunity to be in these very unique spaces. People wonder, you know, you think about the, the most popular Smithsonian is the African-American Smithsonian. And that's just not black people. That's that's everybody. And why is that? Because our history is very rich. Our mm. history is part of the narrative. So and our history is, is rich public. in America because it helped build this country. Absolutely, when they absolutely. And so so when we talk about this space, we have to talk about because what happens is, if you don't have some ownership to it, you don't care about it. One of the things when I talk to young people and I, and I, I work with maybe between 40 to 60,000 people a year with our mm -hmm. events. We do very large events. I do these different events. I do a fishing derby on the Washington Mall. Now think about how difficult that is, that you're gonna take three to 500 kids fishing on the Washington Mall. It's amazing. That's, that's awesome. not the government, that's us. Uh, and Part of that experience that we do is we have to talk about the narrative of not just aquatic education. I got to talk about the Chad Browns. I got to talk about the Sharons. I've got to talk about the people that are resonating out there that they can look at. They, they can look at and see themselves in. Or they can look at, and, and here's the deal, they're just not black that I'm, talk, that, that I'm talking to. I'm talking mm -hmm. because we are all Americans in this space. You know, I, I think about some of the champions of people that are out there. They're just not black champions. They were all, but we all have to be lockstep in this space saying that we're working towards a more equal space. And, and that's really important. I, I, I think I, I remember having a common conversation with Jim Kurt at, at Fish and Wildlife Service. And oh, yeah, Jim was talking, know, yeah, you know, Jim, we was talking to Jim. And Jim was amazing. And I remember he just sit back and he said, you know, you know, I never I didn't think of it that way. And thank you because we get locked in, they get locked in that silo. They get in that scope and they and, and that's their vision. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I said all the time, the hardest person to deal with is the person that is recruiting because they're locked in. It. They're locked in. We just yeah. we got to get these, this, this many blacks or we got to get this many Hispanics when we got to say we got to get people. And the more we put in there, the better it is. Now, that's well, one of the goals. That, that they that, have yeah. a quota. We have to get this many. Well, you and, and they're folks. Times. If we can find you hear this, if we can yeah. find six. You want to find folks and representative folks. And why would there be a number or a quota on how many 
to satisfy some kind or, of or, arbitrary limit. Right. Or they're not, or the person there is not comfortable. They're more comfortable with a different group of people than there. And that's usually some of the things you run into. You're, you're so comfortable Chad, with Chad, I want to pass it back over to you because I know we're running. <laughs> There's a question, Chad, are you going to ask? Uh, and I don't want to put you on the spot. For those who are listening or who are paying attention to what you've said and what you've done, people always ask, so what can I do? What yeah. could I do from the small to the big? What can people do to change this? The listeners that we've thrown out what we've experienced and also we've talked about policy. We've talked about challenges of person and place. We've talked about safe space, access, opportunity. What can people do? They think, well, I can't do much or they continue to enjoy the comfort without recognizing that there's privilege. What can they do? Okay. Right on. Yeah, I That's think I think always we, raise money and support transformation <laughs> and change and diversity. Oh, I tell people I believe in the power of money. Call it evil if you want. Send it to me. I'll clean it in the programs that we do. Uh, go go ahead and hit that home run. Yeah, 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 go ahead and hit that. You know, you know, one of the things that that I think is very relevant is really sitting down there and coming up coming up with a. Uh, idea that we can push. Give me something. For me, I, I'm really in this really cool space where I, I can go back and talk to the lawmakers. I can go back. And the key thing is that you can talk about law, but but until you get everyone to buy into it, it, it doesn't it doesn't resonate. I think about I think about my wife Candy. She sat on the 2012 planning room for the Forest Service. And these group did an amazing job. They did recommendations but one thing that sticks in my head and i still hear today is they talked about shared stewardship and they wrote this up her and her team wrote and so today mm -hmm. you hear shared stewardship everywhere but that mm -hmm. came from work that my wife and her team on on this planning rule worked on so put in put into policy put into recommendations things that can be accomplished that you can get everyone on board. Uh, and I always tell a person, one of the hardest things I have, a lot of my programs, I pay for it myself. Because one of the hardest things you run into is people want to enjoy it. People want to enjoy it. Uh, and But it, it's hard for, I've had, I've had the, the white population say, well, you do a great job and everything, and every, but I'm going to advertise around your show because I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to offend my, my traditional stakeholders. Mm. So you hear a lot of these excuses. Yeah. Or Chad, I, I remember you, you, you did a fundraiser and, and guy came after you and used the N word and, and was going after you on social media. Oh yeah, well, I remember that. I, I remember that. I, <laughs> yeah, I laughed about it. Cause I got called Negro outdoors so much till I was my teeth was white, and you see they still white right. I got it because it was it was crazy, but if I left it up to the people who told me I was going to have a snowball hell of a chance of surviving, I wouldn't have. I've I've been doing this for 22 years, hmm. and it hasn't been easy, and I have become numb to no. Now, realizing I sit on this amazing, huge council of national leaders in the conservation field, I have, and, and think about this, I, I have been, I've sit on this council, I've yet to go hunting with one, any of those people on that council. Out of that council, now think about this, now this is crazy, I sit on this huge council with all these people and everything, out of the council, I had one person call and say, hey, Wayne, are you doing okay with, at the floor. So that tells me, think about that. And I remember one, one woman said, well, you know, you know, Wayne, you know, you like the flavor of the month. Mm. Well, she gone and I'm still here. So wow. that's why they call me Chocolate Thunder. I'm, I'm still here <laughs> and, and, and I'm still kicking. So that's why we have to keep fighting and fight these narratives. And, you know, we can we can talk about the crazy and racism, but definitely start implementing issues. Get the word out, Chad. That's why this is so important. What yeah. you're doing this, and that's why we have to continue having these these uh, series of opportunities to talk about it and come up with solutions. So that's right. that's why I'm so excited about this.
Great. Thank you. No, thank you both for sharing, you know, and, and you ended it well and sharing you ended it well as well, you know, and it is, you know, that I think that, that at the end of the day, you know, um, it, it, it is about changing the narrative, you know, it, it's about how we can uh, work together, cross bridges into other races, et cetera, and come together as one. I'm a big fan of Martin Luther King. And, and so, you know, and, and I, 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 you know, I, I can't recite his whole speech, but there's one part of his speech that he speaks to that I always say to myself is, um, is I, I, I'm not going to chop it up because take it word for word, but he speaks to, um, you know, that when he says something like someday, um, something I, I want to, I, I believe that I will, that we'll see the little, little white boys shake hands, hold hands with the little white girls and the little white girls will hold hands with the little black girls, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and that right there is, that's, that's what I strive and want to see happen more. And that's what we need. We need that cross cultural relationships of many people come together to help us change that narrative. You know, and 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 I think that's that that's just my personal take and everything like that. You know, but I think that's you know, it's maybe it's uh, too far out uh, of a goal, but I don't know. But well, I well, believe no. that, you know, no, I, you know, self interest really counts. People play to their self interest, and when I talk about the benefits of a more diverse, representative group of voices. Studies have shown, science studies, folks who love data, that when you increase the voices, the representation around the table, right. richer ideas emerge, things that have not been thought about because people get stuck. And when you right. look around with people that you assume have the same experiences, have the same skin tone, go to the same places, live in the same places, you are actually reducing the opportunity right. to That's learn right. and move forward. It's been proven. I had yeah. wanted to ask Wayne, but I didn't want to put him on the side. What does that gigantic group look like? How many look like not your familiar flavor? Oh, okay, okay. So let, help, so, 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 so let me help you. Let me help you. Let me help you with this. Because that's what we have to move. Like yeah, folks say, either move the let, table let, or kick it over and build a better well, table. A better table. table. <laughs> well, let, 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 me, let me help you with this. In the history of this, this, I'm the first African-American ever to sit on that, that forum. But what has resonated, though, is sometimes you got to build your own table. That's what I'm saying. So, so when I got in there, I figured out that let me figure out how to get, get and build consensus how to figure and so then i started bringing in people like the mike theards like the elwood yorks who uh who was a, a former judge and brought them in so then i could figure out how to, to build a narrative because then i started bringing in different ideas and 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 busting that that glass ceiling of people and how they thought about how they thought so today think about it we just had the great american outdoor act just passed now think about that, that just passed. And everybody's like, yay, and they're going out. But most people don't realize what just happened. So they put out a billions of dollars in for backlog of, of uh, you know, for cleaning up parks. And and they also, also put in the law, LWC, a land water conservation fund that protects the, the, the water. Uh, and I think it's $900 million a year for that. But really what that says to me that most people don't realize is it created opportunity and jobs. And right now, opportunity and jobs are thin and part. So they're gonna be they're gonna be jobs on how to create new spaces and places and create creating backlogs. They're gonna have to have more people doing social media. They're gonna have so when we look at this space, when we look at it, we need people to know what's going on so we can take advantage of it. Right. Chad, those young people you're taking should be some of the people that we should be looking at as some of the new leaders that's looking at these jobs and careers. That's right. It's basic. That's right. you, you know, it's just like, uh, one of the things I talk about, it, how many people know that they're giving scholarships for people fishing at yeah. college? 
who yeah. knows that? Question so, might be who does know, because people do know, and it's the yeah. same group. Yeah, it's right. the same group. Well, who who knows in my community? Who knows in that urban interface? So so I always tell a person you have to look at it from from that perspective, because not yeah. everybody's bad. They just sometimes the people just don't know what they're doing. Now you know you hear these these people talking about unconscious bias. After you tell them one or two times, then it's not unconscious bias any longer. People so say I tell people that listen, I say it's all explicit if it continues to be expressed. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's so, true. So so you know, so, so that's, say, that's the key. How close is Chad to his time frame? I think we have we we talk more and we talk and share some richness. Uh, Jamie, I just wonder, has there been any questions? Uh, uh, we're going to throw some questions out uh, to ask. Anybody there? Yeah, we, we got a ton of questions, although you all have done a really amazing job of answering them during your oh. presentation, <laughs> um, especially Sharon wrapping it up there saying, what can we do? Um, yeah, I'm serious. Yeah. <laughs> I think well, hold on, give. Give us a call. It, we'll we'll, what we'll, we'll help say. you out. <laughs> Jamie, what did people say? We, I mean, we've got probably a hundred different questions from people in all different kinds of uh, yeah variations. So maybe since you all have kind of addressed a lot of them, maybe just to close out, um, okay. Mention where people can find you. Several people were asking, you know, how do I find out more about Chad Wayne and Sharon? You know, how can I support the work that you're doing? Um, and okay. then if you want to leave us with a a final word of wisdom, whatever that means to you. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So I I, I think I'll, I'm gonna let uh, Sharon and Wayne, you know, let them know where they can find them. I'll just speak to my part, and I'll just pass the baton. Uh, you know, to a close, almost to a closing here, uh, folks, and and thank you everybody for your time. Um, you can. Always find uh, the website of Soul River, which is Soul River Inc. Inc. Uh, and all the information is on uh, the website. And you know, yeah, and I, if 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 you feel the call to want to make a donation, that's also available on the website as well. Um, we're also looking for volunteers all the time. We're always looking for veterans, women veterans, uh, and we're always doors wide open for all youth. Uh, you know, and especially youth of color, if you, any moms, any dads out there that want to get their child involved into the organization, um, you know, all the information is on the website. And if when you email, it's going to go through the uh, field educator and who sh and she will uh, get the email and pass everything over to me. Um, right now, our applications are closed, but don't let that stop you. Go ahead and fill it out, send it in, but we'll get back to you when, when that time comes because our applications will open up in December 1st. Uh, we will have uh, more webinars, as uh, as Jamie mentioned earlier, and stay tuned for that. There'll be another webinar, and we'll be building. It's kind of like building blocks here, basically, and um, moving forward. And so it's a honor and pleasure to have um, um, Sharon and, and, and Wayne here, and, and they have heavy, heavy, deep, rich experiences and that was the idea. And so I hope the listeners out there was able to tap into some of this information and take it. And I think the end of the piece of what we all want to see is changing the narrative, uh, which is the ultimate, is changing that narrative to make it better, especially for our next generation uh, that's that's coming forth uh, today, basically. So I'm going to pass it on to you, Sharon. What I would just say quickly is that I would encourage if if Chad would be real willing, he knows how to find me when others don't. And I come to this in a different way that what I am is that my tag is I'm an imagineer. You know how an engineer actually constructs and builds off of designs that architects and others have put together. You have to have somebody who can engineer and make the ideas real. So I say, I'm an imagineer good ideas, I help you construct a reality because I'm a, a philanthropic, I'm a nonprofit, and I'm a government equity strategist. If you really want to talk about organizations moving mm. to actually not only embrace, but to figure out how to act on opening, working with, creating different tables, listening to the voices, then call me 
can call me by getting in touch with Chad. He has my contact, my email, and That's I right. always answer him. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, so for me, you know, I'm Wayne Hubbard. You can you can find Urban American Outdoors online. I, I tell a person check our local listing, but you also can go to my website at uaotv.com. But if you really want to get a hold of me, you can also call me at 913-334-5177 or check us out on uh, on Facebook or your social media spaces. One of the things I tell people is I do a lot of very large events and engage. So we always are looking for people to be engaged in that space. We do fishing events. We do uh, summits. We're getting ready to do a, a urban outdoor summit uh, that's coming up. It'll be virtual, but then when COVID over, we'll have we'll have a, a physical one. Uh, the key aspect is 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 how do we change the narrative? I think about this, and I'm gonna leave you with uh, I'll leave you with this. Uh, this thought process. Again, I'm Wayne Hubbard. Go on Facebook, look at me. Social media website is uaotv.com. But I want to leave you with this. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So get at the table. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Amen. Thank I'm you honored. all. Uh, thank, thank, thank you for everybody joining, you know, and uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's definitely a, a process for everybody. Uh, we are in challenging times right now, uh, and 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 it's 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 definitely testing everybody. You know, it's testing everybody, and we're we're fighting uh, many different forces right now as well. And the the only way, and I think Wayne and Wayne's probably gonna laugh at this because I say it all the time, but I think the only way to dismantle what we're facing, the enemy that some of it is invisible and, and, and dealing with the ignorance and the bigotry, <laughs> et cetera, is, is loving one another. You know, love is king and it's the, it's the most powerful thing that we can all do is, is show up and show our hearts and come together and stand together. You know, it's the, it's the only thing. And I'm not talking about the love and marriage, <laughs> love and relationship. I'm talking about that deep strength that will, that will call you to respond to the mission to help move forward what's happening right now and changing that narrative. And that takes an act of love for everybody. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I'm Thank done. you all so much. We got so many messages of thanks and praise from the audience and I'll share them all with you. I'll compile them. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah. Oh you, yeah, Jamie. you bet. So thanks everyone for joining us and have a wonderful evening. See you all Thank next you. time. All right, all right. Take care. Thank you, Wayne. I'm gonna Thank go you. get some more seven up. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I got you some chicken soup if you could get it. <laughs> I could use it. <laughs> Thank I'll you. be calling. I'll be getting in touch with you, Sharon. Please right. do. Thank Bye. you. Thank Bye you. Now. Bye everyone.